This may not sound like the most interesting topic to go through the effort of making a video on, but some cool new information came out recently that got me excited about the different seas in this world. I never really thought about it until now, but there isn't any oceans in this map, just a bunch of seas of varying sizes. There are the smaller ones like the Sea of Dorne, the Smiling Sea, the Sea of Mirth, inland seas like the Shrinking Sea, Silver Sea, and the Poison Sea, which isn't actually poisonous, it's just what the Dothraki call it because they believe all salt water to be poison since their horses don't drink it. There is the Sea of Sighs, located near the ruins of Valyria, and the Bleeding Sea in northeastern Essos, both of which have waters that are colored red. The last of the inland seas is the Hidden Sea in the more mysterious part of the world called Further East. All of these places have very little lore on it and are mostly just names to fill out this world's map. Where we get some of the fun lore is in the larger seas. The Narrow Sea is a body of water that we see a lot of in the story. Arya, Tyrion, and Varys, and many more have all crossed here in the current story to travel from Westeros to Essos. There really isn't a lot of distance between the two main continents of the series. I don't see it taking more than a couple days to sail to the opposite shore. There's a lot of trade that takes place on the eastern ports of Westeros, but things get messy near the Stormlands. Storms make sailing near here dangerous, especially in Shipbreaker's Bay. It has that name for a reason. It's especially bad in the fall. Robert Baratheon's parents both died in front of Robert and Stannis when their ship got hit by a storm when returning home from a trip to Essos. The narrow sea ends in a region called the Stepstones. It's a chain of small islands with no true ruler, so pirates make this place their home. Around 12,000 years ago, this was actually a land bridge used by the first men to migrate to Westeros from Essos, where they originate from. It was the children of the forest who used their magic to destroy this piece of land so men can no longer cross over to Westeros. The first men were destroying their forests and warring with the children for territory, so it's understandable. But another race of men, called the Andals, decided to sail here on boats thousands of years later, long after the first men and children made peace. They crossed the narrow sea and first landed in the Vale, where they would eventually spread throughout all of the Seven Kingdoms. A defiant Targaryen prince named Daemon named himself the King of the Stepstones in the Narrow Sea after he conquered this region with his dragon, but he would abandon this title just a few years later. The Jade Sea is a body of water in the southeastern part of the map. This southern region of Essos, also called Further East, is a mysterious place for the people of Westeros. Traveling this far will make any adventurer rich from all the exotic trade, but still few have made it this far. A man named Coros Valerion went on nine voyages to different places in Essos. It's because of him the people of Westeros have information about this foreign continent. And since this map and lore is from the point of view of a Westerosi, I'm going to be talking a lot about Coros Valerion in this video. He was actually the man who helped Daemon Targaryen conquer the Stepstones and the Narrow Sea with his fleet. Coros was Daemon's father-in-law who actually put the crown on his head. House Valerion was one of the more powerful families in the Seven Kingdoms because of their close ties to the Targaryens. They also originate from Valyria and they were lucky enough to relocate their family home to Westeros before the Doom destroyed their homeland. They actually left before the Targaryens did. They probably left because they had no hopes in advancing their status since they weren't one of the ruling dragonlords. The Valerions chose the island of Driftmark to make their new home, off the eastern coast of Westeros. They became renowned for their ships and sailing, and many lords of this house have served as a master of ships. Coral's voyages to the Jade Sea and the many ports of Essos made the Valerions the richest family in the Seven Kingdoms for a time, from all the treasure and exotic trade like spices he brought back with him. To give you guys a better idea as to why so few travel here, it's said to take an entire year to sail to the Jade Sea from the western coast of Essos, and anything could happen in that time. There's some less significant islands in the Jade Sea, but more importantly the famous port cities Yin and Ashai are along the coasts. Corals even filled one of his ships with elephants which he probably got from the Isle of Elephants in the Jade Sea. That giant island called the Great Morak served as a border between the Jade Sea and the Summer Sea. A lot of the locations with warmer climates are found here, if you couldn't tell by its name. The nightmare of a continent called Saltaros, which is mostly a mystery. The Basilisk Isles, Nath, and the Summer Islands are all islands in the Summer Sea, but nowhere near as mysterious as Saltaros. The Summer Islanders didn't know there were other lands outside of their cluster of 50 islands, and when a ship washed ashore to their territory, their curiosity bloomed. They began constructing massive ships capable of crossing seas. Some believe they even managed to map the entire western coast of Saltaros and have been keeping it to themselves. Saltaros is a difficult place to survive, so few travel here. But a dragon rider, back in the height of Valyria's power, flew across the continent on her dragon. They flew for three years, only finding jungles, deserts, and mountains. She believed this place to be endless and as large as Essos. People along the Summer Sea have had to deal with pirates looking to enslave people and sell them off. These waters run up until Dorne, where it transitions into the Sunset Sea. 
But right in the middle of the Summer Sea is an interesting place. After the Doom of Valyria happened 400 years before the start of the story, the peninsula was completely destroyed. A volcanic cataclysm completely changed the landscape, breaking apart chunks of land. Where a small body of water used to be has now become the Smoking Sea. What makes this place so interesting is no one who attempts to sail through here returns. A dragonlord named Arion, who was visiting away from Valyria when the Doom occurred, tried to reclaim his home and become a new emperor. He, along with his large army, were never seen again. A fleet from Volantis, and even a Lannister king who wanted to find what treasure was left behind, all disappeared in the Smoking Sea. Tywin's younger brother, Jirion, who was a lot more wild than his stern big brother, also ventured here with hopes of finding his family's Valyrian steel sword, the Lannister king who traveled here long ago lost. But of course, he also disappeared. There are still volcanoes in this region, and the waters are said to be boiling. But we may have just got a hint at what else lies here in a new world building book called Fire and Blood that details the Targaryen's history. It talks about a creature that no one from Westeros has ever seen or heard of. A Targaryen princess named Arya ran away from home on the back of the massive dragon Beleriand, who was the oldest and most powerful of all the Targaryen dragons. He's so old that he was actually born on Valyria, and was one of the dragons that moved the family from Valyria to Dragonstone. Arya and Beleriand disappeared, only to return a year later with the princess at death's door. She had snake-like parasites inside her body that were boiling her from the inside out. The parasite's sizes ranged from a finger to the size of a man's arm. She was in no condition to tell the maester treating her what she went through during that year. She only asked to be put out of her misery. When put in ice to cool her down, her heart stopped and she died. The parasites, trying to escape the cold temperature, bursted out of her body and also died. They're described as having a face and arms. So pretty goddamn disgusting to have running through your body. Balerion didn't share this infection, but did return with a 9 foot long open wound and some other scars he previously didn't have. The book suggests that Beleriand didn't listen to Arya and just flew back to his birthplace, where the dragon must have fought against something of rivaling size. One man in the current story who claims to have sailed the Smoking Sea and returned in perfect condition is Euron Greyjoy. His older brother, Balon Greyjoy, exiled him years ago for sleeping or possibly raping one of his brother's wives. So he's been sailing as a pirate in Essos ever since. He returns after the questionable death of his older brother Balon, perfect timing to become the new ruler of the Iron Islands. He's returned with artifacts he claims to have taken from the ruins of Valyria. A dragon horn, said to be able to control dragons, and a dragon egg that he threw overboard. He isn't the most trustworthy character, so who knows if he's telling the truth. His entire crew has had their tongues cut out, so it's not like you can ask them either. Back west to the Sunset Sea, where there's some more mystery and speculation. It's the western body of water that covers all water west of the Summer Isles and Westeros, so a vast amount of water. The Sunset Sea is the sole reason I wanted to make this video. One of the most asked questions in the comments of my map videos are what's west of Westeros. I've talked about it a couple of times, but few who ever travel west ever return. However, in George Martin's latest book, Fire and Blood, that came out last month, we got some new fun lore. Some of the fisher boats that go after some swordfish or whales claim that there are some terrifying monsters roaming here. There are stories of krakens and sea dragons. I don't think I'm going to bother talking about Krakens since they're in so many fictional stories. But sea dragons aren't mentioned much in this series. They're believed to live deep in the waters, so I guess they don't fly. It's not confirmed whether they exist or ever have existed, but the Ironborn do have their stories. And there is a peninsula in the north called Sea Dragon Point on the western coast. With dragons and giants being a thing in this story, it isn't so inconceivable for giant water serpents to also exist. The Ironborn tell of the legendary first sea dragon called Naga, so large that it fed on Krakens and Leviathans. Another legendary figure called the Grey King that the houses of the Iron Islands claim descent from is said to have slain Naga, the sea dragon. His bones can still be found in the Iron Islands in a place called Naga's Hill. The throne that the ruler of the Iron Islands sits on is called the Sea Stone Chair. It's made from a mysterious oily black stone found throughout the world that no one knows its origin. The chair was just there on the shores when the first men first landed on the islands. One maester believes this chair was made by a race of people who lived here before the first men. Another maester believes it's from a race of people further west in the Sunset Sea. One ironborn lord attempted venturing west but was blown off course and found himself on the shores of a group of rocky islands. Eight days sail away from the Iron Islands. He built a tower and made his family's home here, calling it Lonely Light. The place is covered with seals, and the rest of the ironborn mock the far winds of Lonely Light for being mad, claiming they sleep with seals and can skin change into them. A thousand years earlier, a king in the north named Brandon the Shipwright attempted to sail west into the Sunset Sea, but never returned. His son, named Brandon the Burner, set the rest of the northern fleet on fire and burned the yard where they were built after his father's disappearance. 
Aegon the Conqueror's younger sister wife, Rhaenys, wanted to adventure here on her dragon Meraxes, but both were killed in Dorne before ever getting the chance. But this is all old news. The new information from Fire and Blood come from a lady in the Westerlands called Alyssa Farman. House Farman's home is in the Sunset Sea. It's an island called Fair Isle. Alyssa always loved to sail and dreamt of what lay west of her shores. Well, to do this would require an insane amount of gold. A large ship, a crew, and enough provisions would cost a crazy amount. Alyssa Farman was disowned by her family for not remaining on the island and marrying a worthy suitor. But she was friends with the former Targaryen queen Reyna. They were very close and lived together for a while. Alyssa Farman asked Reyna to build a ship for her and fund her expedition. But Reyna turned her down because she wanted her to stay by her side, not traveling for years. So Alyssa Farman stole three dragon eggs from House Targaryen and ran off to sell them in Braavos. She changed her name to Alice Westhill to avoid being caught and arrested for stealing. A pretty hilariously obvious fake name since bastards born in the Westerlands, where she's from, are given the last name of Hill. Like the last name of Snow is given to a bastard from the north. And everyone knew her obsession about sailing west. She would never be caught however and she would get her ship that she would call Sun Chaser. It wasn't easy for her to find companions. Here's a quote from a chapter called Jaharis and Alisane, Their Triumphs and Tragedies. Then, as now, ignorant small folk and superstitious sailors clung to the belief that the world was flat and ended somewhere far to the west. Some spoke of walls of fire and boiling seas, some of black fogs that went on forever, some of the very gates of hell. Wiser men knew better. The sun and moon were spheres as any man with eyes could see. Reason suggested that the world must be a sphere as well, and centuries of study had convinced the archmaesters of the conclave that there could be no doubt of that. The scant writings she left behind show that even as a child, Alyssa Farman was convinced the world was far larger and far stranger than the maesters imagined. Not for her the merchant's dream of reaching Uthos and Eshai by sailing west. Hers was a bolder vision. Between Westeros and the far eastern shores of Essos and Uthos, she believed lay other lands and other seas waiting to be discovered. Another Essos, another Southeros, another Westeros. Her dreams were full of sundering rivers and windswept plains and towering mountains with their shoulders in the clouds, of green islands verdant in the sun, of strange beasts no man had tamed and queer fruits no man had tasted, of golden cities shining underneath the strange stars. Eventually she did convince men and two other ships to join her because of all the gold she acquired from selling the dragon eggs by overpaying three times for their work. They set sail in 56 AC. Instead of the northern route the men before her took with a chance of running into krakens or sea dragons, cold weather, she sailed the sun chaser through a southern coast with warmer winds. The first 12 days sailing west went perfectly, but then the wind stopped and a couple weeks later storms started to hit. In the last of these storms, waves higher than their ships were crashing, along with horrible thunder and lightning. Sun Chaser was pulling ahead when one of the two other ships was struck by lightning. Some claim a kraken then pulled the ship underwater, while others claim it was just a wave, but whatever it was, they were gone. The next day, Sun Chaser returned to the other surviving ship with news, Alessa Farman found land. Three islands she named Aegon, Rhaenys, and Visenya, after the Targaryen conquerors of Westeros. There were riches to be found here. The only thing worth mentioning is the great lizards the size of deer. But Alyssa wasn't satisfied with these three tiny islands. She couldn't convince the other ship to continue west with her after they just witnessed a kraken. So after repairs were made, they went their separate ways. Three years after their departure, the ship returned to Westeros, and Alyssa Farman on Sun Chaser was never seen again. Where this story gets even juicier is when Coral's Valerion sailed to Ashai many years later, he found a weathered ship he believed to be Sun Chaser in the harbor. So the Maesters are right to believe this world was round. Alyssa traveled west enough that she made it to the eastern part of the map. We will never know what else she found on her travels, since she was never seen again. Another place covered in mystery is the Shivering Sea. So I definitely saved the best few seas for the end. This vast sea is mostly unexplored and has northern lights that occur in the sky. There's rumors about ships freezing once they enter a place called Cannibal Bay and become trapped forever. The rumors get even stranger with tales of evil mermaids, ghosts that drag sailors into the water, and mist so cold they can free ships. Where things take an interesting turn are the tales about dragons. It's said dragons fly over the Shivering Sea and live in the area called the White Waste, which is just north of here. The White Waste is nothing but ice, snow, and mountains with horrible weather conditions. The dragons in these tales are different from the ones under Valerian control. These ice dragons are said to be far larger than the fire-breathing variant. They are living ice who breathe cold. Like the dragon the Night King took from Daenerys, ice dragons have blue eyes. Coral's Valerion also traveled to the Shivering Sea. He was the first man from Westeros to make it as far as a thousand islands. 
where he decided to turn back after witnessing how hostile the strange islanders were. They have a unique look to them, having a green tint to their skin and being completely hairless. They sacrifice sailors to their foreign gods, and the fish here are even strange. They're deformed and don't taste very good. So it's understandable why corals didn't bother finding out what's further east of these islands. And that's where the Shivering Sea ends on this map. But we do know now that eventually traveling east enough will take you back to Westeros. However, who knows what lies between these waters. The Ebenese are a race of people from the island country Eben, who know these waters very well. Their culture revolves around whaling, so they spend a lot of time along the Shivering Sea coasts fishing for leviathans, which are just massive whales. Map charters from Eben say the Thousand Islands name is just an exaggeration. There's actually less than 300 islands here. With the Ebenese being as skilled as they are at sea, even they can't make it through what lies north of the Shivering Sea. Ships can't make it through the ice, and the weather conditions make many who try freeze to death. And those are the smaller and larger more significant seas of this world. It's so funny when George Martin gives us new information, he also brings into question more mysteries. In my last video about dragons, I talk more about the new book, so you can click or tap on your screen to watch that. Thanks for watching this one guys.